thumbs up if you hear me fine. Uh, welcome to the Eden uh, Open Education Week. Uh, one more uh, event organized by Eden. This year we are joining as, uh, again the Open Education Global uh, in the week of March 2nd to 6th. And uh, I'm very happy that we start today with the webinar on OER and open pedagogy uh, practices, uh, good case examples. And I'm very happy that we have so many participants from all over the, over the world, as far as I can see. I couldn't uh, 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 say hello to everyone uh, uh, individually, uh, but I'm very happy that um, we have so many uh, participants uh, from different countries. Um, if I can have my slides, uh, please. Uh, so let's let's start. Um, so we start with this week with this uh, webinar, but as you can see, there are uh, five more webinars during uh, this week. So uh, you can see uh, in details on Eden web pages. Uh, what uh, webinars and at which time uh, they will be. Uh, also, uh, what is important that um, we as Eden org organization are very much uh, supporting open education and open access. So uh, do, within all uh, our activities, we try to raise awareness about importance of openness of open education resources um, uh, on open education in uh, 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 as well as open research. Uh, so uh, this is our contribution to the global movement of Open Education Week. Uh, as you have already seen, these sessions are recorded and all recordings will be available on our web pages and also presentations on uh, the uh, slide share. Uh, if you have registered for this, uh, for this event, you will uh, earn open badge. So uh, you can add it to your collection afterwards. And um, I will start with the announcement of today's session. Uh, as I said, title is Open Educational Resources and Open Pedagogies, Best Practices. And today we have five uh, presenters who are willing to share uh, good examples of uh, development and use of OER and open pedagogies uh, in teaching and learning. And as you can see, we can we see, we have with us uh, Gemma Santos from Open University of Catalonia, then Irina Volungevicene from Mitatus Magnus University, former president of Eden and my dear colleague, Fabio Nashembeni. Uh, from Universitat Internacional de la Roya and Eden Fellow and my colleague from former Eden EC. Uh, Christotea Herodotou from University, uh, Open University UK and Annelies Kalmein from uh, KU Leuven in Belgium. So um, if I'm, I, I'm certain that you are all eager to hear these presentations and uh, good examples uh, how we can uh, use, reuse our and adapt uh, open educational resources and, and implement them in uh, uh, teaching and learning. So um, now I'm giving the floor to Gemma to start with her presentation titled Open Learning at Work Knowledge Action Plan. Um, just a brief few words uh, about her. She holds a PhD in Information Science and Communication. She works at UOC as a research support librarian but she is also an assist, assist, associate professor of information science at University of Pompeu Fabra and previously at the University of Barcelona. And she is very much engaged in OER, in number of activities. Um, and so uh, I think that that will be enough for the start. So Gemma, I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Good morning. Thank you very much for the uh, for this invitation to the Eden webinar. 
uh, at the first day of the Open Education Week. So it is a pleasure. I will present, um, I'm from uh, Open University of Catalonia, UOC work and working there in the library as uh, it was said. And I will present Open Learning at Work Knowledge Action Plan. Well, first, uh, our university is a fully online uh, university, which was born in 1994. And here you have some data to have uh, context and to know a little bit more our university. For example, we have 70,000, 2,200, uh, sorry, 74 uh, students from uh, 134 countries, and the most of them are um, adult uh, on the uh, older than 25 years as for the teaching staff uh, we have uh, around 4600 teachers okay so um, the open knowledge action plan um, it's a kind of uh, answer uh, to the open to the European Agenda 2030 for the sustainable development, and uh, we want to contribute. Our university want to contribute uh, to the fourth ODS objective for sustainable development, education for all, and this plan is also aligned with the open science and open educational movements. Uh, it was promoted by the vice uh, president for Glo globalization and cooperation, but it was a collaborative task, not just uh, a bottom a top uh, a bottom up, no sorry, a top down action plan. But we were collaborating uh, between different teams at the university, faculty, technicians, librarians, etc. And why an open plan? Well, because we need an internal tool to promote uh, reflection and discussion among the work community to, to build this open focus together, not just um, faculty, okay? So, uh, well, here, uh, there is a, this image is, um, you can click and it's an hyperlink. All of the images in my presentation uh, are linked, so you can, See the web and the website, and also you can download the action plan from here. Okay. So um, the open knowledge action plan is structured in nine areas. Okay. There are six specific and thematic areas, and then three uh, cross-cutting areas. Um, the first two are uh, refer to research, to open access publications, and also the data uh, to ensure the fair principles. The third one is related with open learning, that is our subject today, and I will explain better later. And then the fourth and the five are um, promoting the open innovation and co-creation of knowledge, and also to transfer it to the society. All this knowledge, hope we can transfer to the society. And then uh, the six of them uh, is related also with the um, other kind of evaluation model to assess the research. Okay. So to achieve everything, we propose this action plan, but uh, it's necessary um, change in the organizational culture. It's like a kind of requirement. And that's why we add these uh, three cross-cutting uh, areas that are related with training, communication, uh, aware awareness raising, open infrastructure, and participation in some areas of influence. Okay, what has been done so far? Because the open knowledge plan doesn't have to start from the scratch, because the, the university has been working for years in open education and different projects related with OERs. 
So uh, as here you can see, well, before 2010, uh, the work UNESCO chair in e-learning was working in promoting uh, training and also some skills for creating and using OERs. And then the first milestone in our university will be uh, in 2010 when the open access policy was created, well, was approved, and also um, the institutional repository uh, O2 was created. Uh, during some years, there were uh, participation and also leading uh, in OER and MOOCs projects from work faculty and researchers. And from 2015, more or less, there was also an institutional strategy for promoting MOOCs, the massive online open courses. And uh, then we arrived to 2019 that can be considered the second milestone in our university related with open, uh, open knowledge. But because it's when we create the open knowledge plan, the one that I was explaining you before. So here you can see a little bit what we have been done uh, in the past. And now uh, we will, I will show you at what point are we currently. So currently what, what are, uh, we are doing right now. Um, first, I would like to, to explain that um, our model in, at work, we own the copyright for all the learning resources materials, okay? And they are normally um, created uh, in copyright, okay, with copyright protection. But after six semesters, that means three years of use, they become uh, in open access directly and there are creative commons license so it means that all the authors that work for uh, our university they are contracted with copyright protection at the beginning and then after six semesters uh, we can open all this content but there are also a few of them a few of authors uh, which can uh, also be request to, to create the material, the learning resources, in Creative Commons on the default. But unfortunately, they are not that much. It, repet uh, it represents about 5% uh, five, uh, of the total of the materials of the learning resources. Well, here you have some data about uh, what we have. Uh, 7,000 final bachelor's degree projects, um, 1,600 work open learning resources right now, but after six semesters we will have more. And then also 65 assessment activities. Uh, in this case, I would like to explain you that this is a result of a pilot that we were working with the economic department, economy uh, faculty, that they were um, engaging in sharing the assessment activities and some exams as well and solutions. So we hope that this uh, number will increase soon when the rest of the faculties and departments will join to this pilot. And finally, we have also 14 MOOCs, okay? Uh, this kind of um, learning resources are available at the repository, at the institutional repository, and the MOOCs are available in MediaDAX platform. Okay, where do you, where do we want to get to the future? Uh, open model by default. This is like the, the aim of our university right now. So to change from the copyright to the creative commons, on the fall, from the beginning, not after six semesters, okay? So we want to convert our uh, university in a global knowledge hub that can combine the um, content and the knowledge generated in the university with also the external contribution. I mean, with uh, other peer reviews, open peer reviews, um, faculty and expert that can enrich the learning resources. And how? Can we do that? Uh, by promoting the creation and use of OER in teaching, implementing them in teaching in the classrooms, 
uh, but not just creation of new OERs, but also uh, the, existing, the existing ones, uh, try to use them also in the subsets, try to, to combine both of them. Um, we also uh, want to promote the open knowledge through MOOCs in the most innovative subsets of the university and uh, the co-creation of knowledge in teaching and learning. In fact, we are working right now in collaborative uh, tools and also <clears throat> a project of final bachelor's degree uh, um, right now, I mean, that we are doing this. And also an open textbook about open access and open science. We are also changing our attitude to a more open, innovative attitude. And finally, we sent a proposal for a Horizon 2020 project, also to create a kind of network of open universities. We'll see if it's, uh, finally we have the approval. Okay, so right now, um, I will show you some examples uh, that we have been explaining about the efforts that the university has uh, done in this shift from uh, copyright to open by default. Uh, the first uh, example is related with the infrastructure that has been developed. This is our institutional repository O2. And here you can see that there is a section for academics. That means that it's, uh, you can find all the uh, open learning resources here in the academics. It's a structure in different studies and um, thematic discipline areas. And from here, you can access to the open learning resources. For example, here, maybe you, you can see very well, but there is an open learning assessment activity concretely uh, about marketing. It's a real one, a real assessment activity that the students can use to see a little bit a model that uh, can be a new one. Um, if um, this uh, assessment activity uh, forms part of this pilot that I was explaining to you about um, economy. Okay, another example are the learning materials available in work MOOCs, as this video and other of them in Creative Commons, this MOOC in Business Intelligence. Here, here in the MediaDAX platform, you can access to these 14 MOOCs. Okay, that we were developing, developing uh, uh, from 2017. And as a curiosity, I have to tell you, I can tell you that the first MOOC that we created at work in 2014 was a collaboration, it was a collaborative, collaborative work with two Catalan universities, Universitat Rubira i Virgili and also Universitat of Barcelona. And it was about uh, spoken communication in English. Here you can see a work virtual classroom. This is a real one. Okay, here you have the chronology for the learning process of the student. Uh, here there is the presentation of the subject, the important data, and here the forum uh, to communicate teachers and students. In this uh, section here, you can access to the resources of this subject. And here, the Design Toolkit is a, an example of an open learning material in Creative Commons, open, open. I think that uh, if you can see here is a BIASA. So uh, it was a material um, created uh, from the beginning in open access. In, in with a Creative Commons uh, license, and it's about uh, design. You can access to it through the link, as I told you before. And we have a final example, that is the Open Innovation Initiative. In this case, is the Open Health Parkism. And it was um, it's a, well, a project, a real project, a real platform, Kubik, which is um, created to share experiences and also open ideas and open innovation solutions 
around different topics. In this case, about Parkinson, and it was built <clears throat> not just from the work community, but also uh, in collaboration and partnership uh, with two important hospitals at Barcelona, Hospital de San Pau and Hospital Clinic. So it's a real case of uh, collaborative knowledge um, applied, applied in, in the resolution or at least uh, treatment of the Parkinson. You can access also uh, to the link with all the explanation, videos, and description. And that's all. Well, this uh, here you have some bibliography in case you need it with some of the projects. You can you have more readings. And thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I can uh, try to answer right now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, I, I put two questions in the chat, but maybe I can uh, ask you uh, now face-to-face. Uh, 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 -face. Uh, uh, well, um, uh, are resources after six semesters um, moving compulsory into open access as OER or on, dem on demand? And how teachers no, no, are reacting to the, yeah, to the yeah. issues? time their, their materials will be uh, in open access? This is a good question. It's not on demand. It's like compulsory because uh, in the contract that the author signs at the beginning, there is a clause, a clausule that says that after six semesters they will uh, convert in a Creative Commons material, in an a open material. So it's, um, it's a reality. But I have to, to say also that then it's a very slow process after the six semesters because we have to change the license in all the, all the learning materials. So it takes some time. It's not like direct. We have then permission because there is a contract. But when you have to do it, it takes some time. So we are slow. But yeah, after six semesters, uh, we can do it. OK. Thank you. Uh, please look at the, the chat. Uh, I see there is a question, if I'm correct, uh, from Helene. Is the toolkit also available in English? Uh, mm -hmm. In the chat at the end? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, among, uh, among the questions. I'm not sure what she meant by uh, toolkit. Uh, maybe this platform uh, where you, which you have for the academics, with the ah, design toolkit, is it available? Ah, the design toolkit. Ah, okay, this is um, well, uh, this is an uh, open learning material for the design degree that was created uh, from between some teachers at work, and it's a kind of there are they are sharing different design tools for the students, so it's. it's it's a material that you can also check and use if you want. I mean, it's open for you also. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, that one, Helen, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, please, participants, if you have any questions and comments, uh, you can uh, put them in the chat. We will look at them and the presenters will answer them uh, after their presentation. Uh, I'm uh, now thanking uh, Gemma for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have uh, more questions for her, please put them in the chat. She will uh, answer them uh, by writing. And now we are going to move to the next uh, presentation uh, from Irina, Irina Volongevicena from Vitatus Magnus University in Lithuania. Uh, she's director of innovative studies there, and also she is former Eden president. And uh, she has been working for a number of years uh, on open education. Uh, so I'm very happy to have her with us today. Uh, title of her presentation is Integration of OER in Formal University Studies, VMU Teacher Experience with SlideWiki. Irina, hi. Nice to have you on the board. Please, floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Sandra. I hope everyone can hear me well. It's a pleasure to be here with you in Open Education Week and see so many uh, active participants in the chat. Uh, today I will uh, focus on um, one specific uh, method which we applied in the framework of possibilities uh, that were provided from Horizon program project and concretely from the Open University UK. Um, and uh, we use these possibilities in order to foster uh, open pedagogies actually, uh, openness among uh, our community members in, uh, in our university. Uh, through the use of uh, OER, Open Educational Resources, in formal university studies, and I will tell you uh, how we moved uh, uh, through this path. Uh, the university is a um, campus-based university uh, which operated uh, for decades in face-to-face uh, -face mode. Uh, but uh, for the recent 10 years, uh, the university uh, addressed different innovations and uh, one of the innovations is open educational practices that are fostered by different uh, community trainings, projects, open course developments, uh, OER developments, OER adaptations and uh, of course all goes uh, through collaboration. We are not that big as Oak, of course, because this is uh, a campus-based university in Kona, but uh, very international and uh, I would say open. Uh, so the context uh, why we decided to participate in, in, um, in one of the calls that was uh, published by the Open University to uh, start piloting, uh, applying uh, slide wiki platform in formal university studies. <clears throat> of course, we uh, appreciated the possibilities provided by the Open a platform and a very well known slide wiki tool. But uh, actually, the context was broader. Uh, we are all addressing now in Europe uh, uh, di digitally competent educator model in one or another way. And uh, of course, OER development uh, competence uh, groups are there. Uh, despite of the fact that they are uh, divided from innovative uh, teaching and learning competence group and also empowering learners, but uh, all of these steps in, at one or another stage are finally linked together. So I will now illustrate to you how. So, uh, the project I refer to you is the SlideWiki.org um, uh, project uh, that received funding from Horizon 2020 program. And you see the reference to the platform and to the project. And when we found the call, uh, that uh, the coordinators and the consortium are looking for institutions who are willing to test the platform, we thought about several synergies here. First of all, uh, when we ask our teachers to develop OER, they uh, do participate in training sessions, they do start developing OER, but finally uh, we see that in the mainstream they uh, simply again uh, go back to the resources that they uh, already uh, get used to and they do not uh, share, redevelop and redesign OER uh, uh, quite often. The second thing is that uh, it is quite seldom that teachers would create activities for their learners, empowering them to create uh, assignments, to implement assignments 
that would also be based on open solutions. And of course, finally, it was um, the chance for us to discuss also which um, technological solutions might trigger uh, academics in uh, OER development and also open innovative practice development and to provide feedback uh, for the developers. So we wanted to focus on uh, talking with teachers and students about the benefits uh, that OER can bring. We wanted to talk with them about the triggers they find uh, with using technologies in the form of studies. And we also wanted to see how the attitude of teachers changing in the process when they are accompanied through the, from the very beginning until the end of the whole process. So uh, we organized the, quite a focused sequence of activities that was already more or less uh, two years ago, um, maybe a year and a half if we take um, the perspective of the final activities. But uh, still, uh, we are very happy with the results, and that is why we, we do introduce uh, this pilot uh, here. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I will start with the results. Teachers created the open educational resources in the format of slides. They integrated them in their online and blended courses, actually all university um, courses are in a blended way uh, available for our university students. So we have more than 3,000 courses uh, every semester in blended learning offered for students. And then we have for completely online programs and courses, but not to that amount already. We have only four programs that are offered in, in an online mode. And the teachers created the slides and they also used them on, as theoretical materials or theoretical references uh, or learning resources. So that did not ask for student active engagement. However, uh, the second part of the request for teachers in, in this context and this pilot was that they also develop activities for students that would ask students to uh, create their uh, assignments using uh, Slide Wiki platform tools. Uh, th those uh, were uh, open slides. So to say, to activate and empower uh, their learners and students' engagement. The platform provided these possibilities, uh, of course, through technical challenges and everything, because uh, most teachers are used uh, to tools uh, for slide development that they have in their uh, on their desktops and computers. But uh, finally, they, all, they, they used the slide wikis and applied uh, open, uh, um, open licenses to their work. We, uh, as I mentioned to you, we also wanted to track how um, attitude and opinion of teachers who participate in the pilot changed. So we applied the survey, but we also interviewed the teachers after OER testing with students. It happened in formal university studies. So, um, of course, it's quite positivistic and quite optimistic. But before the development of OER, we asked teachers uh, if uh, they uh, have sufficient skills to uh, develop, adapt, and use OER, if they have enough uh, information and knowledge about uh, licensing, if uh, they know uh, what are the requirements uh, and how, what are the possibilities of reusing OERs. Also, we asked about the responsibilities of the authors. Uh, we asked them uh, how far they think OER promotes collaboration and establish uh, collaboration among different parties and consortia, and how, uh, in, in principle, how such activities as developing OERs, sharing OERs, and adapting OERs 
might enhance uh, personal and organizational reputation. And we are really very happy to see how this awareness uh, develops. So if we see in blue the restriction, the, uh, the bias that teachers had in the very beginning in the spring semester when they were introduced with the tools, with the platform, with the possibilities, and they all of them had to sign agreement um, about participating in the whole pilot. We paid our teachers uh, for this experiment uh, from a service contract with the Open University. And then uh, we uh, asked them to develop a react and to provide feedback regarding the challenges they had uh, using the tools uh, for OER development, but also uh, we um, provided training for them about uh, uh, application of, open, uh, of com Creative Commons licenses to the slides. And uh, finally, when they develop their OERs, they have to integrate these new resources into their form of studies and implement a form of studies with students. So after all these three phases, you see how uh, the attitude um, towards uh, the development of OER changed. And we especially appreciate it uh, that they shared the very positive uh, uh, and rewarding uh, feelings to what, like pleasure uh, if someone uh, picks up OERs developed by themselves and adapt them or um, use them as educational resources in other courses and then uh, how uh, also it enhances their personal and organizational reputation and promotes collaboration. So, uh, of course, survey was not enough and we went into the more qualitative feedback from teachers. We had the interviews with them and the teachers uh, actually uh, shared with us that uh, uh, they managed also to develop their pedagogies into a more open way. So that was... Um, something that we could dream about only because whenever we try to talk with the teachers, integrate technologies into teaching and learning, innovate their pedagogies, we are always cautious about the fact that technologies might fail, they might also fail to manage and control the situation the way they want and then receive satisfaction. But in this case, one of the major benefits most probably was that they found the ways to engage their students into learning. They found the ways to create new activities where students are more active, so active learning activities, and then where students share the responsibilities with them uh, for co-authoring, co-developing learning resources, and then even uh, um, presenting uh, their activities, their assignments to larger groups, uh, to their peers. And uh, I think that was one of the things that teachers appreciated most, most of all. But you also see other citations here in the text, um, and, and most of them uh, are positive comments. We often speak that um, the new generation, sometimes we stereotyping, uh, sometimes not, but we think that people uh, are already uh, in their uh, student, uh, during, the, during their studies, during student life, they are more open and more flexible. And uh, we, uh, we received the, the feedback uh, from our teachers uh, that they already recognize and acknowledge it, but also uh, that they need to change their uh, point of view and uh, their attitude, uh, not uh, take all the responsibility on, on their shoulders as teachers, but share uh, the new flexible analysis and open ways for their students, because they take them already as natural ways of learning and uh, contribution towards co-authoring, co-development of learning resources 
comes uh, through very simple sometimes and the creative way. So um, by, by this I, I wanted to share with you, we already shared uh, these experiences in other reading events, uh, in conferences, and we also um, testimonied from, from our colleagues from other countries that sometimes using um, very simple scenarios but uh, supporting teachers consistently from point A to point Z, uh, facilitating them and opening uh, their pedagogies together with them in a very simple but very powerful and effective way through opening uh, uh, themselves uh, well, is a very, very rewarding, um, rewarding experience. And the final note that I would like to, to share with you that um, uh, since a couple of years already, sometimes um, uh, we hear when teachers uh, share with their peers the lessons, when they are asked, but what do you do with your knowledge? What do you do with your practices, with your slides when you teach? How do you, how do you share it with your students? Maybe they distribute it, maybe they copy, maybe they open to someone else. And uh, our teachers already say that, uh, you know, the best way for us to, uh, to be confident about recognition, about uh, uh, reference to, to us as professionals, is to develop learning resources and to publish them in an open site. Uh, so that everybody can see uh, what was um, my position on that, what was my resource, uh, my slides uh, that are now shared with everyone and uh, in a very open and collaborative manner. So from uh, Vito Basmanos University, we wanted to share this with you and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Irina. Very, very good example. Um, well, if all teachers should be motivated as your teachers uh, to start uh, with things like that, uh, I see that you got really good responses. And I think that this engagement, active engagement of teachers uh, in, a, in a training and especially with students as well, uh, seems like a really good uh, choice uh, uh, so the teachers uh, become interesting and motivated to implement uh, new things in their teaching. Uh, process. Um, so, uh, did you have did you have uh, some teachers who resisted uh, to all this? Uh, how did you, how did you deal with them? Yes, we had. Uh, if I may say so, we we had dropouts. Uh, we actually invited more teachers. Some teachers um, did not take part in this specific pilot, but were invited to, to other initiatives uh, all over Europe. But in this specific pilot, we had a call for volunteers. Uh, then uh, when we started uh, the activity with the teachers, uh, we had uh, 30, 40 teachers more or less, and then we had dropouts. So, so uh, the numbers that you saw now are the ones that took part from the very beginning until the very end. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, I, I'm really impressed uh, by that. And I think that this is, uh, to all of us, a really good example uh, how to try to, uh, to implement some new things with, with active engagement of teachers, because uh, from what I see, they are not any more eager to be passive participants when take training, but also with involvement of students, because I think the students are very powerful uh, uh, a part uh, in this training pr process. Um, okay, I see that uh, mostly com uh, comments are in a way that uh, congratulate you uh, for the presentation. So if uh, any more uh, questions come uh, in the chat, uh, please uh, answer them. Thank you again for a very nice presentation. And now we are moving to the next uh, presenter. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Fabio Nascimbeni from uh, Universitat Internacional de la Roya, which is assistant professor on e-learning in innovation there. Uh, also, uh, he is a Telefonica chair on digital society and education. He was uh, my colleague in the Eden uh, Executive Committee for a number of years. 
Uh, he is a member of a number of associations, uh, but his main research interest is in open education, among other issues. So uh, today he is going to present um, uh, uh, on building a competencies framework for open teaching, the Open Gain project. So Fabio, I'm very eager to hear about this uh, open um, the teaching uh, competences framework. So floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra, and great to be here in this opening webinar of the Open Education Week. So it's uh, really good, and congratulations for the agenda that Eden has set up for this week. I think it's uh, a very good contribution. So I think I will, I will, well, I will try to be brief, especially because I'm presenting you something which is starting, so some starting ideas and a, a call for, for contribution, and speaking also on behalf of my colleague Natalia, who is working in this project uh, with me and with our team. Uh, so let's just one slide on this project called Open Game, it just started and we are about to get uh, online with the website, so still no, no URL for, for you to see there, but uh, it's coming up very soon with some partners uh, which uh, you will know, Nantes uh, with uh, Colin de la Higuera, Dublin City University, UAB with Antonio Teixeira, so there is a lot of Eden, uh, I would say, um, spirit in there, uh, and others, of course, uh, and basically the objective of this project is uh, not so much to deeply train uh, on open educational resources and open educational practices, this is also there, but it is especially to inspire higher education, higher education uh, uh, educators, teachers, lecturers to use open educational practices, to be more open in the way they teach. And uh, we, we have been working quite a lot at CUNIR on, uh, on the teachers themselves, and that's why I was uh, so impressed uh, by the figures uh, uh, of, uh, shown by Irina before of your, the very positive and open attitude of your, of your teachers. So I, I think that's a very good, very good starting point. It is not the, the case everywhere in Europe and worldwide. So we are trying to focus on the teachers uh, with our uh, research activities to try to see how we can actually change the mindset uh, and inspire them. And in this specific case, we, we are betting on a game to inspire them called Open Game. We still don't know actually what will be the name of the game, but the idea is to have uh, as a main result of this project an online game, a mini gamified course, but we say, let's think about this as a game on open education, so that teachers can actually play the game and understand by doing so in, a, in, an, in, in, a, in an interactive way and in their language, at least this is what we are aiming at, so English, French, Spanish and Portuguese, uh, what, are the, what can be the benefits uh, uh, for them, for their daily teaching. So moving down from theory, moving down from, uh, let's say, practices which exist, which are very good there in the air, but through the game perspective and approach, we try to put the teachers really in charge and at the center of, of these practices to show them basically how, uh, how things could change and how easy it could be. So actually, we, we, we discussed a lot how to start and how to structure this game, and we, we decided to start with challenges. So actually, we, we have identified a few challenges that uh, open education, uh, OER, uh, use of OEP, can contribute to, uh, so to solve these challenges. And then uh, for each challenge, we have identified, uh, uh, and this is the, 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 most of the work we've done up to now, a number of real life cases of open teaching that can contribute to solve these challenges. And that was not really easy. First of all, because we tried to focus on Europe, not exclusively on Europe, but mostly. Uh, we found a lot of examples and a few collections of practices from Canada, from the States, uh, not many from Europe, I have to say. And especially we tried to look for cases uh, of non-English uh, native speakers, uh, uh, teachers. So we went, uh, we have a lot of cases from Spain, from Portugal, but also from the south of Europe, from Greece, from France. All in all, we collected 80 something cases, uh, out of which 24 will be the core of our work. And we think already 24 cases, uh, in, let's say, structured following the different challenges is already a nice, uh, uh, a nice case base to show how really uh, adopting open approaches can make can, can really change and improve the way you teach. Now, every case is connected to a real 
uh, teacher, so a person that is implementing that or has implemented that, and uh, we are now talking to these people to check how these uh, can be uh, replicated in different, uh, in different settings and what are the competencies needed to do that. Just to make an example, a classic case is uh, how a teacher has, from Spain in this case, for example, uh, how a teacher has transformed his course into a MOOC, how he did it very successfully, how many students he has, is reaching now, and uh, what it took. So what, uh, what he needed to go through uh, in terms of rethinking his, his approach, rethinking about his, uh, his learning outcomes, and so on. So, and we are trying to uh, present this as, a, a, for, let's say, following a challenge and uh, with some instructions on how to make this happen. So for every challenge, we have two or three uh, different, uh, different practices. Now, in order to do all of this, uh, we had to start from uh, one of our obsessions, at least one of my obsessions, uh, not only mine, I know that some people, uh, I can quote uh, Andrea Innamorato, whom many of you will know, who is working at the JRC of the European Commission, working a lot on uh, guidelines for teachers. And many times we have been asking ourselves, uh, uh, what can a, a, a competency framework for openness be built? We all know, and Irina was showing it before, that the European Commission uh, is becoming really known now with uh, the, the DigiComp, and especially with the DigiComp Ed framework, so a framework for digital competencies for teachers, <clears throat> which contains a lot of openness, which contains a lot of mentions to OER, but which doesn't, let's say, com cover all the needs. So we <clears throat> we looked into into literature. We we found uh, an OER competencies framework uh, done by the uh, Agence Internationale Universitaire de la Francophonie, together with Alexo. So focused sort of uh, on uh, on the Mediterranean, but not only. We found a lot of research uh, on this, uh, and uh, and let's say we 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 gave it a try. Actually, we we considered competencies in the classic way of the European Commission, so attitude, knowledge, and skills, try to explain, especially when you talk about open education, the importance of having an open attitude, but also the importance of being able really to do things in practice. Of course, we try to go beyond OER. Our project is not only about OER, it's about uh, open teaching, of which OER, as I will show you in a moment, is actually a central part, but it's not the only part. And uh, we are working on this. We have a first draft, uh, the, um, let's say, um, which we are uh, planning to, to, as soon as the website will be on, we will, uh, before publishing this, uh, this uh, framework uh, into a handbook that we are, that we are planning to produce uh, together with the 24 practices uh, and uh, the, the competence framework with the different competencies defined. We, we, we would like to engage the, the open education community in uh, commenting this and in, in reaching it. We have actually alre uh, already, uh, we have already engaged the community in looking for the practices. A number of practices were suggested through Twitter by some colleagues and some of you also, if I remember well. So let's say we are trying to do this in, a, in an inclusive way as much as possible. And uh, as Eba says, actually, this is also connected. Uh, we, we also looked into the open ed uh, competence framework, actually, and we, we, we took something from there. Actually, we found that many, um, many frameworks or many indications or guidelines around open education exist, but uh, either they are very much focused on OER or on MOOCs or in course production. So we try to um, cover as much as possible the whole spectrum of, of uh, different competencies. And this is how it looks like. Last slide, so I won't uh, go in, into, into big details on this, also because the font is very small, because I wanted to put all of it in a slide. So I will just explain you the structure. You see on the top uh, a prerequisite, uh, the fact that teachers must be somehow digitally competent. So even if, of course, uh, OER can be used also offline, uh, we think that a certain degree of capacity to work with technology is needed. This is pretty obvious, but we wanted to put it there. Also to distinguish ourselves and our framework from a uh, digital competence framework, let's say. And then uh, we have two main competence areas. Uh, one is about OER, so learning resources, open resources, is one, and one is about open pedagogies. 
We have identified eight competencies, uh, four in the, first, uh, in, in the first competence area and four in the second. So for OER, we have competence one, <clears throat> being able to use open license, being able to search for OER, being able to create, revise, and remix OER, <clears throat> and being able to share OER. And, and then, as you can see on the, on the right, for every one of these competences, we have identified a, a, a definition of the knowledge that the teacher must possess in order to, to implement that activity. So in order to, to, be able, to be able to use open license, you need to know what open licenses are, you need to know uh, how they could be used, and then you need some specific skills. So uh, of course, uh, knowing how to mix different licenses is different than uh, knowing about open licenses. You need to have done that before. You need to have at least tried to do that before. So the, the third column, the column on skills, is on the more practical knowledge. Uh, and then if we go on the open pedagogy part, which is actually the newest one, uh, because on the first part we found a lot of stuff happening, whilst not so much on the second one, we have identified four more uh, competencies. The first uh, is design open educational experiences. So it has to do with designing, course design and, and uh, activities design. Uh, the, the other one is about guiding students to learn in the open, which uh, includes all the co-creation, all the possibility to uh, collaborate with students and let them uh, look for their material online. Uh, so it, it is a lot connected with being able to also look as an example to them. Then a very important one, teach with OER, which is not just search and share OER, but actually implement OER in your teaching. Think of wikis, uh, think of curating, uh, this is all there. And last one, implement open assessment, because we believe that assessment shouldn't be considered just as, a, should not be considered as a separate part with respect to pedagogy, but should be there uh, because by, by implementing openness within assessment, uh, you would, can actually uh, change a lot of things in teachers and in students' behavior. And last point, uh, you can see here vertically the, the column A, it is a, a transversal attitude that teachers should possess or at least should explore which is common to all of these competencies. So what, what Irina was, uh, was mentioning before, the fact that teachers shouldn't be afraid of sharing, shouldn't be afraid of uh, making a mistake, uh, shouldn't be afraid of being recorded and all these things. We try to capture that in, um, in the attitude. I think I can stop here. Uh, I will just, uh, uh, of course, thank you for the comment. I see some comments there. And uh, we think this work is, uh, was due, actually. We, we, when we started looking for this, uh, we have, for example, Ulf Ehlers in the consortium, uh, who is one of the originators of the OEP concept itself. Uh, and Ulf was struggling when, it, when he needs to teach openness to his uh, professors. Where do I start from and where do I finish? So is OER and open license enough? Should I just focus on teaching and OER will come? So we try with this framework to answer to, to these questions. And again, soon this will be online, commentable, and we hope to get as, as many contributions as possible to make this actually a resource of the, of the whole community of movement. All from my side. Thank you, Fabio. Very interesting project. I'm very eager to see uh, the results, especially the game. Uh, you know, always games are always good. Uh, but uh, regarding this uh, framework uh, for open teaching, uh, I know uh, that Andrea already said that they are looking how to integrate it into DigiComp Edu as the seventh uh, pillar. Uh, it looks very nice as from what I saw uh, now here. Uh, uh, I'm really, really hoping that uh, it will be integrated and uh, much more uh, implemented uh, uh, worldwide uh, because DigiComp Edu is becoming uh, quite a base for number of initiatives and projects and uh, work and adding this part will be definitely in important. Um, I was just being uh, chatting uh, with some people about uh, the, the teacher's eagerness uh, to implement uh, OER in their teaching. Uh, we saw the, the examples uh, uh, before and the year one with games. We are always looking for the ways um, how to motivate teachers to start one new more thing. 
uh, what I'm saying is uh, that we so we always leave the existing workload workload as something which shouldn't be changed. Instead of looking how we can uh, improve the existing workload, but not by just adding new things. What do you think? Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, especially we have one big fan of respecting the teacher's workload in the consortium, Colin de Leguera, UNESCO chair, who is actually obsessed with uh, not touching and not overcharging teachers because actually, and he's totally right, and, and UNESCO has recognized this, I mean, teachers should be safeguarded in, in uh, I mean, the more you put workload on them, uh, the, the highest you risk to, to lose quality. It's, it's obvious and to, to increase frustration. So. Actually, in this, uh, uh, when, we act, when we go into the skills uh, that are not described yet, uh, at least not publicly, there we try, of course, to, to point uh, to resources that teacher can, can use, uh, not only to learn about this, but also to facilitate their, their, their life. So to do these things uh, possibly fast and, by, and by, by not increasing too much their workload. Of course, we know that uh, every innovation brings some... Uh, some capacity building time and incentives uh, should be the way, but that's uh, out of the scope of this in, of this work, even if in some cases we are seeing that uh, some incentives are, are coming out. Now in China, they are thinking, for example, due to the coronavirus uh, of uh, incentivizing a lot the production of OER for university teachers and uh, on, for online learning. So when, when the need is there, I think, and policy moves, uh, let's say we, we are trying to, to prepare the tools for this to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. We, we could go more into discussion, but uh, I uh, leave uh, the chat, uh, the discussion for the chat. Uh, so we move on. Uh, you, you got us with the game. It's not important what you said behind the game, but with game you got us already. But thank you. Thank I you know, Will, uh, for the game. OK, and then now we are moving to the next uh, speaker. From Open University UK, we have with us uh, Thea Herodoto. She's associate professor, and she uh, is uh, uh, also uh, interested in evidence-based design and evaluation of technologies for learning uh, through innovative research methodologies, including learning analytics. And uh, she holds funding from National Science Foundation Wellcome Trust. Uh, and ASRC to improve design of online citizen science platforms and, and so on. She, she works uh, a lot um, and uh, she is um, also uh, working on learning analytics quite a lot. But here today she is going to talk about evidence-based pedagogies for the futures. So uh, Thea, I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you. the mic. Oh, hi, Sandra. I'm sorry I had it muted. Uh, thank you for inviting me over and uh, for organizing this event. Um, so, yeah, um, I work at the Open University at the moment, and uh, my talk today is about evidence-based pedagogies for the future. Um, before we just as a means of introduction, um, by pedagogy, we refer to teaching, learning, and assessment. And by evidence-based pedagogy, I refer to the use of research evidence uh, as to whether a teaching approach is actually working in practice. And so, for example, if a teacher wants to use a mobile application in teaching, uh, does uh, he or she know whether this works and for who, which students is it for the good performing students, is it for the underperforming ones, and how they should actually integrate this into teaching. Uh, so throughout the presentation, I would like you to have in mind this uh, question. I, I'm not sure whether there will be time to discuss or answer it, but it's good if you have this in mind, um, and especially if you are educators or teachers. Uh, how do educators uh, make decisions about which pedagogies to use in their teaching? So how are these the teaching decisions made? Is it based on teaching expertise and long-lasting experience of uh, teaching students? Or is it based on research evidence? Or is it based on some different combination? So just as a food for thought, I guess, this question. Um, uh, 
so we've um, heard a lot about the future of education and we heard uh, big organizations uh, and like the OECD saying that we want students to develop skills that can actually embrace complex challenges. And in relation to that, we've seen several frameworks talking about the 21st century skills. Uh, such as critical thinking, problem solving, uh, uh, moral attitudes, learning to learn. Um, and I mean, despite the fact that uh, uh, there is this uh, uh, intention to improve the educational system, what we actually see at the moment is that uh, the international um, evaluations show that the students uh, in some countries countries uh, are not really performing well. I mean, a popular um, uh, student assessment is PISA, and they showed, I think, lately that 20% uh, of countries are actually uh, below the baseline in uh, topics such as math and science. Uh, in addition to that, we also see the educational systems focusing more on testing and memorization uh, and, and achieving like national uh, standards, uh, which in a way this is um, uh, um, motivating teachers toward uh, adopting more traditional or conservative ways of teaching. Um, and all these things are not really ways that can help, you know, students and our uh, learners learn more from uh, uh, what is being taught. So what is, um, what I want to argue in this presentation is that uh, a way that we could potentially bridge the gap between our vision for education and what is actually happening in schools at the moment uh, is if we adopt uh, uh, innovating, uh, innovating pedagogies uh, as to how we teach our students. Um, and actually, a few months ago, I worked with some colleagues at the Institute of Educational Technology, and we produced a framework, a set of criteria that uh, all of us, or some of us, I mean, could actually use uh, in order to choose uh, what ways uh, they can use um, to teach. And this framework is made of five dimensions, I would say. It's what you see on the slide at the moment. So we talk about uh, pedagogies that are relevant to effective education of theories. So theories that we know that work in practice such as, I don't know, social constructivism, for example, uh, the, the evidence about the effectiveness of the proposed pedagogy. So whether they, we are actually having evidence about the specific way of teaching that it does work in practice, uh, then whether it, it relates to the 21st century skills that so many frameworks talk about. So it's actually applicable to practice. Uh, what is the new aspect of these uh, pedagogies? And this, I think, mostly relates to advances in technologies, such as, for example, the use of artificial intelligence in education. And the last uh, criteria has to do with the level of adoption of the pedagogy in practice. And actually, it's good to know whether it's uh, diffused or not into practice, because this can actually give us some direction as to what the next step should be in terms of developing that uh, pedagogy further. So a core um, aspect or dimension of this framework is evidence or the role of evidence in any decisions we make in terms of teaching. And uh, by evidence, we, we answer two main questions. First, whether there is evidence to back up the use of a specific teaching approach. Uh, and then the second question that needs to go with the first one is whether this evidence is actually strong enough so we are confident that whatever the research suggests is actually robust enough and says that uh, suggests that, that the pedagogy we plan to use um, uh, can have positive learning outcomes. Uh, so the, what I have on this slide is the evidence pyramid, which in a way organizes and groups together the different types of evidence uh, we can have. Uh, so the, the base of the pyramid is the most popular and the most commonly found evidence. And these are most of the times opinions, either from educational experts or practitioners' wisdom. And then the top of the pyramid they are uh, less frequently found types of evidence because they are more hard to produce, I, I would say. And these are uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which in a way they put together, they review and put together different studies, they compare them, and then they conclude with um, an outcome as to whether uh, there is an impact uh, 
for example, on learning outcomes. And we use this pyramid to assess a set of uh, innovating pedagogies. Um, so ju just to say a last, uh, a last note on evidence is that um, in general, uh, um, in education, the notion of using evidence to inform our teaching uh, has been popularized the last few years, I would say. And uh, perhaps here in the UK, what contributed to this um, uh, popularity is the work done by the Educational Endowment Foundation. Uh, they've been offering money to run randomized control trials uh, in education. And in a way, they have now um, uh, created a database uh, with different teaching approaches and evidence as to whether they work and for whom. So, for example, they found out that homework for secondary uh, students is actually contributing to uh, better learning outcomes. Uh, but in addition to that, there are similar um, organizations in the U.S., like the National Center for Education and Evaluation. And, of course, there are several centers. Uh, I put here some examples from U.K. universities uh, where they focus on doing research around teaching and learning. Uh, I mean, and one of them is where I work at the moment at the Open University. Uh, where we try to understand what kind of improvements we can do to our systems um, in order to increase uh, student retention and performance. So the pedagogies I'm going to talk about uh, came from a series of uh, OER that we have been publishing since 2012. Uh, so this is, this is actually a series of reports uh, that is compiled from academics uh, in the department I am in. And they talk about the innovations in teaching that we think have the potential to change the way we teach and learn. And uh, in the last few years, we have been partnered with different institutions to produce this kind of report. Uh, I mean, this year in January, when the report was, uh, the 2020 report was produced, it was a collaboration with the National Institute for Digital Learning in Ireland. Uh, so we, draw, we reviewed all the um, pedagogies we, we published over the years since since 2012, and we came up with, um, uh, we, we picked, uh, I would say it's more of also a preference. There was no reason of picking those specific uh, six ones. Uh, and we talk about them in this paper I mentioned before, which is the uh, open access uh, published in front US in education. Uh, so we use the framework I presented before and assess in a way the effectiveness of these six uh, pedagogies. Uh, just briefly to explain what these mean, uh, formative analytics uh, refer to learning analytics, and they are used by students to uh, help them reach their goals and help them regulate their learning. Uh, with teach back uh, is this process of having two people working together and teaching each other. And although the concept is quite old, uh, we thought that it's quite innovative given that this can actually happen through computers and through the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, Place-based learning is about what students can learn from getting in touch with their communities and learning about the culture, the physical environment, and how all these aspects can actually feed back into the teaching that's happening in formal set, educational settings. Uh, learning with robots and learning with drones uh, is more about using specific applications as part of the teaching process. And the last uh, example, citizen inquiry, is about uh, citizen science and uh, how we can actually engage volunteers and people in citizen science activities in ways that they can actually learn how uh, science works and how they can actually act as scientists and learn through this process. Uh, so the, for each of these uh, pedagogies, we produce a, a table uh, that, in a way, uh, is an overview of what evidence exists around each of these pedagogies. Uh, for example, the formative analytics, I uh, will just pick on one example, uh, I mean, given the time up, uh, that's left. So formative analytics, uh, we notice that there are, are some randomized controlled trials done, some quasi-experimental studies, but most of the studies are exploratory in nature. Uh, so it seems that there is upcoming evidence that this, the use of analytics with students is actually working and is actually improving certain learning areas. 
Um, in terms of the level of confidence, we use here another framework, uh, the NESPA Standards of Evidence Framework, uh, that gives a quantitative assessment of our level of confidence. So by level four here, it means that uh, there are uh, several similar studies done by independent uh, authors or reviewers that they replicate or they conclude with the same outcome. And, uh, we, and this one, if you see all, all the um, numbers in, in this column, you can see that it's one of the most uh, maybe advanced uh, type of pedagogy. Although we note here in the future directions that uh, more could be done to improve certain uh, other sub uh, uh, areas that have not been assessed yet. And we've done this for each of the six pedagogies we talk about in that uh, paper. Uh, this is actually my last slide, and I would like to conclu conclude just by uh, raising uh, the need to make decisions in teaching and learning that are actually informed uh, by some sort of evidence as to whether what we are planning to do is actually working, as opposed to doing to making random decisions and putting them into practice without having some uh, a priori information as to whether they work and for whom of our students. Well, I would like to thank you for your time, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thea, very much. Uh, very, very nice uh, proposal for innovative pedagogies. I'm certain that uh, some of them uh, got us thinking uh, about the possibilities, how to, how to use them. Uh, as we have uh, been going to the end, um, I see that uh, the questions are now uh, not so many in, in the chat. But please look at the chat uh, and the uh, uh, comments, and please continue uh, to discussion in the chat. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I think it's very, very interesting and very well uh, contributing to the previous session uh, with ideas how to uh, do teaching uh, in a different way. But uh, a very important part is also engagement of the students, what we have seen before. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, and now we are going to the to the last slide uh, to the last presentation. Uh, with us is Annelies Kalmein from uh, Catholic University at Leuven. Uh, she is member of uh, their MOOC team, and uh, she has a uh, hands-on experience with all aspects of develop developing a MOOC. So um, she is going to talk to us today about. XMOOC, if I'm correct, uh, as the title says, behind the O. So, oh, okay. Annelies, can you come and floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yes, so I would like to thank you. Um, so, the, the X is not XMOOCs, but it's can you live X because that's our channel uh, on edX. Uh, so, I'm, uh, I'm Annelies. Uh, I'm from the KU Leuven MOOC team. Um, and the KU Leuven MOOC team is the team that supports teachers in making MOOCs. And actually, we consist of uh, the a combination of the IT department, the educational unit, and the video department, because all these aspects come together uh, in MOOCs. Um, so as um, Sandra already said, I have some personal experience with developing MOOCs, because I, I actually made my own MOOC. But now I'm also in the supportive team. So um, I have experience on both sides of the MOOCs. So KU Leuven started making MOOCs in uh, 2014. And today, we have 18 MOOCs uh, on edX. And we have learned a lot of things uh, throughout those years. And some of them I'm going to share with you today. But before we can get uh, started, I have to explain first what a MOOC is. Uh, although I think a lot of you already know what it stands for, I would like to go through the, through the words uh, anyway. So MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. Um, and I would like to start with the C, uh, which stands for a course. So for us, it's really important that people realize that it's an actual course. So it's not just uh, like a, a set of videos. It's really a course with a learning path, learning outcomes, uh, different learning activities. So we really try to encourage our teachers to make it an actual course. It's online. That's the O. Uh, so it's completely uh, online. Of course, you can still use it in an offline setting. But the course that you put online has to work 
in its online format. Then it's also open, uh, which means it has to be accessible throughout the whole world. Um, and because it's open and online, it's often also very massive. Uh, most of our MOOCs are between 1,000 and 10,000 participants. It can be more, but it does change uh, your teaching style. It's not possible to give uh, students personal feedback, for example, that's very, very not, not a good idea uh, when you have 1,000 participants. Um, but today I would like to focus on the O of open. Um, and there's some challenges uh, related to that, uh, but also some opportunities. So the first challenge, and I'm sure uh, all of you uh, know this, is the, is the copyright. Uh, it's a very important one uh, when creating MOOCs because everything has to be copyright cleared um, or, uh, or under, under Creative Commons. Um, and then correctly referred to. Uh, a lot of the times we either try to use partnerships to get the copyrights, but very often it turns out that we have to make our materials ourselves because there's an, an extra challenge in MOOCs and that's the worldwide accessibility because open in one country does not always mean open in another country. Open for some people doesn't mean open for everyone. Um, and that definitely limits the possibilities, but it also is a challenge to go out in, on the internet and find good resources. Um, it's also very important that all the material that is essential to the course is uh, online in the course. Um, so it's not a link through another website, uh, but it's really there and to make sure that it's accessible for everyone. Um, but it's definitely a challenge because it's usually much easier to just link to a YouTube video or, or some other interesting resource, but unfortunately we have to make sure it's all there. So that's challenge one, a very technical challenge. Um, then there's challenge two, uh, which has to do with the students. Um, so it's an open course, and that means that anyone who participates does so voluntarily. And that makes it very, very different from a classroom. Um, people in a classroom are usually forced to sit there. I mean, they, cho they choose to study, but they don't always choose for all the classes. Um, well, uh, in a MOOC context, everyone who participates, everyone who subscribes uh, is there out of their own uh, will and motivation. And that's the nice thing. It's actually not a challenge, but an opportunity. Uh, most of those students uh, will be very intrinsically motivated. Uh, and that makes, it, that makes them a very critical audience, which is very interesting, but also a very motivated audience. However, on the other side, it's open, so they can just stop anytime they like. Uh, there's almost no other motivations apart from this intrinsic one. So um, you have to really keep them uh, engaged. Uh, they usually do it in their free time. Um, they don't always get it combined with their, with their life. So you, you, we really see a very, very high dropout uh, when it comes to MOOCs. Um, however, we, we find it really important at KU Leuven that the success of a MOOC is not measured by the amount of learners that do the entire course. It really depends what the goal is of, of your MOOC. If it's, if it's outreach to, um, to developing countries, for example, uh, whether you just even get one person that you can change their life with, um, there's a lot of different ways of measuring the success of a MOOC. So there's also some opportunities um, to the open aspect. Um, and one of them is definitely uh, the community. The nice thing is, uh, in our MOOCs, we always make sure that there's discussion forums and usually also discuss discussion assignments where the students have to give examples from their own life, from their own region, um, from, from things they have learned, they have seen. Uh, and you really get this um, community, this worldwide community, uh, which has a common interest. Uh, and that's, I think, a very, very valuable aspect because then you get exchange from all these different cultures, contexts, people 
uh, that share their um, experience. And it can even lead to very interesting research exchanges like we had in our MOOC. Uh, we actually had some people uh, coming over here uh, to, do, to do a research exchange. So it can become a not only online exchange, but even an offline exchange. For example, we also had one MOOC uh, where the discussion forum stayed alive for two more years after the course was archived because people from different places found each other. Uh, and that's, that's definitely one of the biggest strengths, I think, of this openness. But there's more. So apart from the, uh, this, this community that, uh, that, that arises, it can actually also be a very uh, valuable thing for you as a teacher. And we really emphasize this uh, at our university when, when people think about making a MOOC one of the, the major feedbacks that we got from teachers in making a MOOC is um, it really forces you to rethink your course, to rethink your material. So yes, on the one hand, it's quite the workload, um, but the outcome is weighing, weighing up against this workload. Because you have to, for example, um, one thing in MOOCs is knowledge clips. So they're like six minute videos in which you explain a concept. It's very brief um, and it really forces you to get back to the essence. Also, you have to uh, redesign your course to, to fit and it really makes you rethink all the aspects um, of, your, of your course. And then you put it online and then all of a sudden you get feedback from a worldwide audience. And they're usually, because they're so intrinsically motivated, much more critical than your own students. I don't know about, about you guys, but students in Belgium are usually very quiet and we don't get a lot of feedback uh, from them. Uh, and actually when we put it online, we do see a lot of feedback uh, on the course material, on the way of teaching, on concepts that aren't clear. And uh, we, we have learned a lot from that. Um, and then uh, we can go already to um, the, the next opportunity, and it's also, also my, my last slide and last opportunity. Um, it's not that much related to the open aspect, but I do think it's a very important thing because uh, of, of also stimulating teachers to create uh, MOOCs is that they can use it in their own teaching. So either uh, we have teachers who use it in a blended learning or a flipped classroom uh, concept, so the students would prepare something at home by watching parts of the MOOC, by also interacting with this international community. Um, uh, ooh, I'm, I'm reading the chat and I'm distracted. Um, so, uh, and, then, and then they would go to the classroom and either uh, get some more information or uh, ask questions to the teacher, work together on a task. And we've had some uh, really positive feedback on that and I think it also lowers um, the bar to using other types of OER in, a, in the classroom. Um, so that's definitely a very good evolution we are seeing here at our university. So that's, uh, that's the openness uh, of MOOCs. So uh, thank you. And if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to, do, to answer them. Uh, thank you, Annalise. Very, very good insight into MOOCs uh, and these uh, some uh, comments which are not usually uh, available uh, to to others. So very important. Yeah. Uh, I see there are some questions for you here in the chat. First one from Robin: Have there been any problems with culture clash, or does the interest in the subject prevent the type of the problem? Um, so. Most of the time we see that the, the combination of cultures has a very good effect because also the interest in the subject. We do see that there's some sensitive subjects. Um, I don't remember exactly which course, but at, at one time we had someone with a very strong discriminating opinion in our forum and then we did have to block that user uh, in the end. So it can happen that with sensitive subjects there is I don't know, is it a culture clash, a person clash? Um, for example, we now also have a course on vaccines running. Uh, so far it's been going well, but of course vaccines is also a sensitive subject. So depending on the subject, there can be, a, there can be some conflict. 
Okay. Uh, the another question is from Kanan Barot. If there are so many participants in a MOOC, how do you forge individual relationships, relationships to make the most of the cultural diversity? Yeah, so that's that's a, a really hard one, especially as a teacher, it's very hard um, to forge individual relationships uh, with, with the learners. There's so many learners, the forum is, is big. But usually, especially towards the end of the course, you will see which of the learners are the most active and the most engaging. And I, I, I often see that some learners often find each other in these forums and start commenting on each other and they do get some really strong interactions. But as a teacher, it's, it's a bit too much to really follow up. But sometimes we do get the explicit question for contact info, uh, for example, with the exchange that we set up. Yeah, and then we have the third one from Linda. Uh, she would like to learn more about the leadership uh, aspect. Could you give mm -hmm. some more context on the question? It just says, uh, awesome presentation on MOOC. I'd like to learn more about leadership aspect. Yeah, but aspect. Linda's typing, so I <laughs> I'm just going to wait for her input. Yeah, OK. And uh, also see the question. Um, on MOOC and credentials, do, do participants get some credentials uh, for participating okay, in so MOOC? Okay, so I'll first answer the credential MOOC and then I'll come back to the question of Linda. So MOOC and credentials, um, I know on edX there's um, the micro master's program and I think already also a micro bachelor's program. So then students do get credentials. At KU Leuve, we currently have no MOOCs for credits, but we, are, we do have a, a team working on that to see how we will make it possible. Uh, it's a pretty complicated subject, <laughs> um, but it's definitely interesting and it's definitely a good way to attract people also to your course that they really have something of value um, in exchange. Um, and then the, the type of leadership needed, I think, Linda, you're referring to as a teacher, what do you have to do within the course? Um, yeah, okay. So. Um, so on the one hand, of course, you have to create a course design that is as self-sufficient as possible because, because of the massive numbers, it's not possible as a teacher to really uh, have a lot of in-depth personal um, interaction. What we, what we always do is make sure that the teachers moderate the forums so they will check, for example, for very uh, for problematic learners, for example, uh, also answering questions of learners. Um, but also motivating students to interact. Maybe sometimes, depends also a bit on the topic, uh, maybe making the topic a bit more uh, interesting for them. Um, so it's, it's a, it depends a bit on the, on the subject, but it's especially the first run, quite some effort for the teacher. Okay, and the last question is we are already over the, the time uh, we have planned for the webinar. So the Robin asked, do you find that you need to prompt discussions in real time or do the discussions sort of occur nat naturally and asynchronously, such as what happens with email chains and conversations? So um, what we see there, so you can choose to either have your course instructor-paced or self-paced. And when you do it in structure pace, it means that uh, one week, one module is released. And that means that all the students are about the same time in the same part of the course. And then you will get much more active discussion forum. So then there's really this in strong interaction. Otherwise, if it's a self-paced course, it's open for like six months. And then the communication is more um, asynchronically and it, the, the discussions are less alive. Um, so if you really want to focus on discussions, it definitely has to be instructor paced. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for participation. Yeah, thank you for I would like to thank all my presenters uh, from the beginning, Gemma, Irina, Fabio, Thea, and Annalise for joining us today, sharing their experience. Very interesting examples. Uh, I think that all of us uh, can take something from this webinar today and think about it and see how we can implement it in our work. I would like to say to announce the next webinar tomorrow at noon. Uh, we already tackled the issue of recognition, so tomorrow webinar is going to be on open education recognition and credentials. 
And also at the end, I would like to invite you to join us at the Eden Conference in June, which is going to be in Timisoara in Romania from 21st to 24th June. So uh, more interesting topic, more interesting presenters, possibility to discuss, uh, to engage, to collaborate. So uh, till tomorrow, I wish you all the best. Thank you all for participation. Bye.